Buenas noches, good evening, welcome. I'm Malta Moreno Vega, founder of Creative Justice Initiative, and I welcome you to this panel discussion among priests and priestesses and among friends. And the topic is Yoruba and diaspora principles, ethics, and values. And why the topic? It comes from a conversation with Marie Nieves, actually a post that she uh, put on Facebook, talking about values and ethics in the time of technology, in the time where change is happening rapidly and people want uh, kind of McDonald's rituals, right? And things fast, uh, pre-packed and without that. And we got into this very long discussion, which we knew was not going to end. And today's panel is an introduction because we know that the topic is broad and uh, it has to be deepened as we explore with elders, with younger priest priestesses, and look at the whole role of technology and uh, change in uh, this point in time in our history. So let me introduce you to the moderator and the thought provoker on this panel, Marie Nieves Alba. Good evening, Malta. Thank you so much for having me and for having us. Um, I have the great pleasure of sort of bringing together this evening and, and moderating a discussion with three really dynamic panelists. And so I wanna start by saying that you know, we have we have a really varied representation of experience on this panel. Um, we have an elder priestess of Yemaya, media maker, producer, educator, um, Angela Fontanes. So I want to welcome Angela Fontanes. Good to be here. Thank you, Angela, for being with us. Um, we have another a yelder. I'm going to call her yelder because she's technically an elder in years, but she's a very young woman, <laughs> scholar and priestess of Obatala, Akisi Britain. Thank you, Dr. Britain, for being Thank with you. us this evening. Thank you for inviting um, me. And I'll say hailing from the People's Republic of Brooklyn. We have some regional diversity as well. So we have Florida, Brooklyn, Puerto Rico. Um, and then we have a priest of Ifa, our brother Rafael Maya who is with us from Rio Piedras, Puerto Rico, and is actually initiated in the Nigerian tradition. So we have representatives from both the Lukumi tradition um, that sort of originates in Cuba, ultimately in Africa, but is preserved in Cuba and brought to the diaspora um, through migration. And then we have a brother who actually returned to the, the womb, if you will, um, and is representing our, our Nigerian brothers, you know, the, the, the Nigerian branch, if you will, of our tradition. So I wanna welcome you all and thank you for being in conversation this evening. Um, as Marta said, and I, I had the opportunity to speak with each of you individually, you know, the, the sort of motivation for this discussion was really, you know, I guess the, the sort of the centerpiece or the seed of this discussion is really around how we navigate change as a community across generational lines um, across cultural lines when the sort of cultural currencies and social currencies of each generation are shifting, right? So not so much in terms of our racial and ethnic culture, but the culture of the societies that we live in and that we interact with um, as religious people, as initiates and priests. And then, you know, this sort of the, the discussion about the very complex and dynamic relationship between ancient sacred traditions and sacred spaces in the modern world, right? And so one of the things that I think Marta really wanted to, to send to the, for us to kind of really get into sort of the relationship between sacred ancient values, ethics, and practices in relationship to modern technologies, right? Modern currencies and also modern economies, which I think is a really, is a really important sort of piece of this discussion. And so each of you bring a very unique perspective to that discussion, um, very unique professional, personal, and religious experiences. And also, you know, together, we kind of represent multiple generations of practice. Um, we come from families and or communities that have transmitted these traditions um, for generations now um, in different regional and geographic locations in different racial and cultural and ethnic communities. And so, but we share, I, I believe actually that we share 
our heart, right? The heart of what we practice and believe our philosophy and our worldview is shared. And so I think that that is going to make for a really rich discussion. And I want to say to our viewing audience that we don't expect and we want to we set your expectations. We don't actually expect for this discussion to result in any sort of concrete action or steps. We really want to generate a dialogue that's really going to um, sort of get us to think more critically and more deeply about how we continue to preserve and transmit our, our religious traditions um, while adapting, right, to changing conditions, environments, um, and even needs that may emerge, right, as we begin to engage with technology. And we also, you know, I want to add that a really important kind of underpinning of this discussion is that we, we actually understand, and I think all of us on this panel this evening understand, that there is an inherent value to being able to foster and cultivate community and fellowship, right, across geographic lines. The fact that the four of us can be on this panel together this evening and that we have, you know, brothers and sisters and siblings watching from across the world right now is a gift of technology, right? Maferefungogun. So we want to we wanna honor and uplift that as well. Um, but also, I think, add, right, the, the idea that, that the use of technology and other modern sort of features of our modern life also carry a great responsibility, right? And that we have to create systems of accountability in order to ensure that we can use all of the tools before us responsibly. Um, so with that, I'm going to invite you all into a question. Um, and so I want us to begin at the very bottom of the discussion, at the baseline, right? And start by sort of asking you from your own perspectives to share, what are the ways in which technology, in particular at this moment where we have, you know, in addition to just technology and computers, we have social media and social media proliferates. And for certain generations, it is the way in which people not only remain connected, but it's actually the way that they manage and maintain relationships, right? What are the way that, ways that technology facilitate community building, cultural transmission, um, specifically for our religious communities at this time? And then what are the associated risks with that, right? What are the associated threats? How do we, how do we navigate the tension between all of the positive kind of um, things that are facilitated and, and the potential risks that we're taking by mediating our relationships in this way. And I invite any of you into that question. Nobody wants to start, I'll start. I wanna say hello first to uh, Oluo Iboruoya, Alafia to my sister. I'm very excited to be here. And this is certainly an example of our technology. You know, when Mata um, and, and uh, Marinieres and I spoke about this, this project and this, this whole concept, I did a lot of reflecting. I was initiated in 1974. And uh, I thought about what it was like then and what I came into and how I learned. There were no books. There were no books. Well, the doctors had beepers, but there were no beepers. There was there was nothing. There was nothing. There was two books, and I had my little ancient book, which I got busted reading, El Santo. This 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 was the book, 1972. As you can see, it's been through a lot, and I got busted reading it. You, you didn't get books. This was 70, 72, and I think this this was 71, and this was 72. My my um, El Lupo Me in America. These, these were the true books that were out there. And of course you couldn't read them, but you know, if you weren't initiated, so there was no way of learning. The way I learned this religion was practicing it, looking at what was being done, being told what to do. That's what I learned. Now we fast forward 50 years and uh, I'm considered a dinosaur. And I looked it up, I said, well, damn, how am I a dinosaur? I'm not that old. And it's like, you know, not, not, uh, not, not changing with, with, with modern times. Well, yes, I have. You know, someday I'm going to have my second annual Zoom Misa with my godchildren in California, 
in, in New York, you know, um, we, I, I, I showed my goddaughter in, in Frisco, uh, she's in Fresno rather, uh, how to throw Obi over the fo over FaceTime because there was nobody available to throw Obi for her for her Ocha birthday. So we so we use it, and I know that I can go to certain websites and I can find everything that I want. The dilemma is what's good and what's bad for not for me because I know what I'm looking for, but for a person who wants to know about the religion, who wants to get involved in the religion, and is caught up in getting all this information on all these sources. Every time I turn on Facebook, I see a new organization forming, a new religious organization. They're in Canada, they're here, they're there, they're everywhere. Where does the person who doesn't know go and not get built, not get abused, not get, you know, uh, this, is, this, is, this is the dilemma, that the technology is there and we could use it for wonderful things in terms of communication. But the issue of abuse, the issue of, of, uh, of people getting beat for a lot of money through the use of, you know, oh, send, send a 20, you know, people do readings over the internet, et cetera, and so forth. We have the technology, it's, it's wonderful, but how can we not abuse it or how can we keep people from abusing it? I don't know. We have to start the communication. We have to start educating people. The Caribbean Cultural Center, which Mata was uh, um, uh, originally part of uh, and has now moved on, uh, they started this process in 81 when they did the, uh, the World Conference. I found this. This is another one of my, uh, my, my special uh, uh, documents from the past. In 81, the first time that Africa and the world got together, Mata made this happen. You know, mm -hmm. this was the beginning, but it wasn't that long ago. So we're in the process now of getting somewhere where we can utilize what we have, but how to utilize it best is, is the situation that we're in. Thank you so much, Angela. And I want to, before the next panelist responds, I want to kind of just highlight the importance of one of your points, which is that while we have technology and we've adapted somewhat to technology, our religion is learned. It's an experiential um, experiential learning is sort of the primary modality for learning, right? Because even if you did have a book or a manual or a website, we all know that there are things that you could only learn by doing. Um, and then fundamentally, part of the expression of these traditions, whether we're talking about Candomblé in Brazil or Vodun in Haiti, Lukumi, you know, <coughs> Nigeria, is that these are also embodied traditions, right? They're embodied. We pray through movements. We pray through dance. We pray through song. We pray through through drumming. Um, among other things. And so with that, I want to invite Akisi into the discussion um, because Akisi, you also have a very, you know, you have a lens toward sort of the specificity of place, right? And how our very like localized expressions and connections to one another in, in tradition um, sort of inform how we practice, how we learn, how we connect. So I want to invite you into this question as well. Uh, thank you, Madi, and thank you, uh, Martha, and my co-panelists. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, thank you to the audience. Um, yeah, so part of my, I'm an Olobatala. Uh, I was initiated in 1984 as a child. Um, and the way I learned, of course, was next to my elders, right? Um, but what is interesting and what Madi was referring to in terms of the specificities of place. I'm also um, an anthropologist. I'm an Africana studies uh, scholar. And one of the things that is very interesting is that each place, whether we're talking about Cuba, whether we're talking about uh, in Nigeria and Yoruba land, whether we're talking about Brazil, whether we're talking about Brooklyn, right? Each place or the Bronx or Miami, each place has put its stamp on our practice, right? Each place has within ritual, we can see how things have been influenced by uh, where it is, has developed. So the emergence of this new technology, because, you know, technology has always been with us, right? Uh, one of the ways that I look at this. I, I study um, 
my 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 main focus of my study is looking at African American Lukumi practitioners and their relationships with other uh, Arisha practitioners throughout the diaspora, right? And how they manage uh, difference and 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 change, right? Mm -hmm. um, and one of the ways that one of the things that I also look at is how do people use digital platforms to build community, you know? And how does this uh, translate into new ways, extensions of old ways, or our complete subversions of things that we understand, right? Uh, and things that we're used to. And what's fascinating is that the tradition, we, we oftentimes, at least uh, amongst my elders, the way uh, I was raised in the tradition is a constant talk discussion of the dy dynamism of the tradition, right? This is a dynamic tradition, Odu is living right? Odu is not stagnant. It is not something that was written 2,000 years ago and has never changed. With human evolution has come the, the growth and the development and the deepening of each Odu, right? And so technology has always been part of our practice. Uh, technology has always been part of the development of tradition, whether it was the technology of recodifying it, right, once it got on the shores of uh, Cuba, or once it went from a purely oral tra tradition to being uh, written down in libretas, right, and, and, and people using these small notebooks to learn and to pass on, you know, to, 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 to capture information. That is also technology, right? And so at each phase of the development of the tradition, and the development of the tradition from one way to the next, there was always this kind of tension. There was always this kind of eruption of, of well, is that right? Is that, you know, does that follow along? I can imagine, you know, when we think about Obatero and Efunche and Latuan, when they were recodifying the tradition, what they went through and, 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 and the elders, what they went through in terms of deciding, well, we're gonna do this, which is different from how it was done in Yoruba land, right? Uh, what did their elders say? What did the people around them say? Right? Like you can't do that. That's not how it was done. Right. So I'm I'm fascinated by what we are seeing now, which of course does bring ethical issues. You know, what does happen when uh Mari, one of your in uh opening statements, you talked about what happens when people are introduced to the tradition outside of its context, right? So when you have <clears throat> books like Children of Blood and Bone, which wonderful book, doesn't quite get Arisha right, but I don't know if they were trying to get Arisha right, but because there was not a discussion of this is not really what it is, I'm just taking my own uh, creative license. What now happens when you have people who have no connection to community, no connection to practitioners, um, and 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 what really the, the the tradition is about? This is how they learn it, right? And then add to that a uh, 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 plethora of the of other celebrations of indigenous technologies that now people have access to right what happens when you get that outside of the context of what it actually is we know we all know how people this is one of the big things i often talk about people talk about oshun all the time and people get oshun wrong all the time right because they don't understand Oshun in the context of how we understand that energy, how we understand that Arisha. And so they jump off, you know, they see the yellow, everybody's like, oh, she's a child of Oshun and she must be like this. We all know Oshun's are not like the caricature that we uh, see. So it's, 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 I'm particularly interested in this, this, this moment of how we come together like this using technology again my fetifuno boom to figure out well how do we deal with this which is actually something that has been happening throughout the tradition right this is just a kind of uh a more modern or newer uh iteration of it so i'm looking forward to the conversation Thank you, Akisi. And I think um before Rafael, before we bring you in, I think something that's really interesting is I remember in the mid 90s, um, I was doing research on the construction of gender in Lukumi tradition. And the way that I could find practitioners um, at that time, this is when computer screens were still black with green font, <laughs> right? 
we didn't have the World Wide Web in the same way. We didn't have access to imagery. We didn't have access to living images, dynamic images, video, and and you know all of these other media in that space. And and I remember that like so much information was shared literally behind the veil of a screen. And I think like what's really unique and different about this moment is that there's actually no longer a veil. This is actually a moment of like hyper exposure, right? And so, you know, Rafael, you and I had a really great conversation and you raised one of the most important points, which is that even all of us on this call and with all respect to my elders, because Angela, I'm like, I'm, I just came out of my teens, you know, I'm like 20 years initiated in Obatala and Akisi and Angela, like Alagua Alaguas, you know, we all, even the Alagua Alaguas, have elders, right? We all have people that we stand beside to learn no matter how many years of initiation we have. And Rafael made this point in our discussion, which was that learning happens in layers, right? And learning happens through apprenticeship. And back to the original point, learning happens experientially, right? So you could read all the manuals, watch all the YouTube videos and wear all the sunflowers <laughs> and still be very ill-informed, right? And so, Rafael, you know, I think your perspective is also really unique because, you know, a bunch of us are water crossers, but you crossed a very vast ocean <laughs> um, and are also, you know, practicing an African tradition in a in a society. Right. In, you're in Puerto Rico, which is absolutely part of the African diaspora, but in a society that is heavily Christian. Right. Which whose conditions are. Um, I would say akin to what I grew up with. I grew up in New York City in the South Bronx in the 80s, in the 70s and 80s. And I remember when my mother was a Yawo, you know, it was like a secret society. You know, I imagine in Brooklyn the same, right? It was a secret society and maybe you saw a Santero and they'd see you and be like, Santo Yawo, you know? But then there were people on the street who would be like devil worshipers. This was the age of the believers and the serpent and the rainbow and all of these Hollywood films that actually vilified African religion, right? So now we're like on the other side of the spectrum where Beyonce has made Oshun popular, right? And there's stuff happening in popular culture, but there's also a lot happening in the popular imagination, right? Where people have more access to imagery, media, et cetera, and think that that actually um, legitimizes their knowledge, right? They're like, well, I saw it on, I saw it on YouTube or I went to a website <laughs> and, and, like, and, and you still miss, there's still a huge gap in your learning, right? So, so Rafa, for you, you know, would you talk a little bit about sort of how technology has both mediated and facilitated your connections with multiple diasporas of Yoruba land, mm -hmm. right? Um, while also, you know, kind of posing this question right around the tension and the responsibility attached to that yeah thank you mari thank you marta thank you akisi thank you angela uh, yes i think um one thing that's super important to mention is that these traditions right these spiritual practices are of community so however the community moves, and in this case, especially now during this, these, this pandemic, right? And even before, we have been relating a lot through the internet and through like, even when AOL was there, AOL was the thing. We all had AOL, we all had ICQ. It's just been a, a constant process, right? And I think that now during the pandemic, it's just kind of boom that like out of control because we had to be at home. We had to be connecting. And, and there were people who who needed guidance even more than before. So there was no way to to get on a on a boat or get on a plane or whatever or a train and get to certain areas during the pandemic. So there wasn't even an option on if we could be there to do the ebo or the ceremony or not you know right. so it was important that that these uh fountains of information kind of opened up you know and that's when we started doing more um especially my elders my brothers were doing more and still are sermons so ifa sermons over the internet so maybe it would be one of one of the temples um in los angeles they do three uh 
they do a sermon a week plus they do two prayer groups a week so imagine it's like great because then people who weren't actually practicing so much could connect and be with the olua of the temple and and be able to learn certain things be able to practice prayers and then be able to watch through a whole sermon once a week as well so it was very very utin obviously for me i mean and this was before the pandemic, right? Uh, and this has to do not only with Ifa, this has to do with all types of traditions. Like there's so much information on the internet and what Ia Angela mentioned is, it's hard to, for people to know what is good or what is relevant or what is a trick or what is, you know, and that doesn't change, you know, there's certain things that, that we have like, um, which I, I'm thinking about uh, writing on there as well and getting into it, but the Wikipedia where everyone can kind of go in and like add and like comment and stuff. And I think that's those kind of outlets or those kind of medios are very important um, to be able to have like kind of common denominators um, within different traditions, right? Because obviously everyone's trying to find ways that were different, you know, especially like within the different ramas. So like Lukumi or, or Ifa, like from Nigeria or Candomblé, et cetera. They're all trying to find differences, but really we should be seeing the similarities that are happening and learning how to grow in community so we all can just continue building. Um, as I mentioned, Mari, that, you know, this, the none of the things that we do for it, at least us in the secundering family, which is under our elder uh, chief, Sholak Bale Popola, none of the things we do, we do without a, getting a, like asking him first or finding out what our elders would think or what our elders opinion is. is. So the fact that we give a sermon online is not something that we just said, oh, let's do this. No, I revet, like, opposite from that it's actually something that our elders like are like you should do that and i was actually part of um a conversation with the different oluos from the different temples around the world and one of the things that was said was like chief wants us to be giving sermons like what's going on with the temples who aren't giving sermons this and that so it's not something that is like we're doing behind like a uh, back or something that's new, like that the youth is doing. And no, it's actually um, a lot different. <laughs> uh, and, you know, it, it's been good too, because in the sense of the temple that we have here in, in Puerto Rico, eh, Oshe Balefon, eh, we've been able to connect with different people. We've been, I've been able to give um, small classes of the things that I know our elders have been able to come in and talk about certain things. So it's given a lot of access, right, to, to people and information that a lot of these um, people wouldn't have access to. And I'm not just talking about, I mentioned the temple, but not only in the temple. You can go on Facebook and literally watch the sermon, like, so anybody can be on there. And nothing happens like... Uh, ritualistic nothing like that it's more about information and talking about um character and talking about shifts of attitudes etc it's not like a you know i guess we talked about that as well maria about the aspect of showing certain things on video um maybe we'll get into that later i don't want to like get ahead of myself but thanks for the for the space familia no, I, I think I think that thank you so much, Rafael. I think that I think actually that's exactly where we're going next, right? Is just what happens then, right? Given that um, you know, to Angela's point, even I who am relatively younger, I don't think I'm youth anymore, but are relatively younger in the biological years, right? The way I was raised, so Akisi's to use Akisi's terminology, the way that I was raised in the religion, right? You know, we we did grow up in a culture where you you also had to earn access to information. Right. And you earned it by through through doing through through labor, through actual sweat equity. Mm -hmm. Right. And demonstrating your proficiency in something. Well, let me let me let you do this one little thing. And if you can demonstrate that you can do this successfully as I instructed you to do it, then I will authorize you to do something bigger. Right. And I think, Angela, you started to touch on that a little bit. So what happens? 
what happens when, I mean, Rafa, you pointed out, like, you're still obviously still engaging with your elders in that way. I think those of us on this panel are all still engaging with our elders in that way. But what happens when the system, right, when the system gets cracked open, right? What happens? How does it change the nature of the dynamics of learning and teaching um, and, and even the integrity, right, of what we are doing when you have an Aleyo come to you and, well, I already saw, you know, X, Y, and Z online. And I already know, I was telling someone the other day, I think I was actually telling Marta, you know, one of my kind of, um, something that I grieve that like makes me a little bit sad is like, you know, the idea that when I was initiated and subsequent initiations that I've had, you know, I literally like, other than the things that were obvious, like I saw my mom dressed in white for a year and seven days and I know what the receptacles of the Orishas look like because they lived in my home. I didn't have expectations about what was happening on the inside of the initiation mm -hmm. because that was protected territory, right? So it was very much still a secret. <laughs> and, and my faith, I went in with deep faith and trust, right? That whatever was on the other side of the curtain was good for me but without knowing the details of what that was. And now so many of those details are exposed, right? Um, through these platforms and through the use of technology. So Angela, like as an, as an elder who has seen many generations kind of come through the, through the religion um, and who is also a godparent, right? How do, you, how do you manage or how does it change the dynamic of teaching and learning um, and stewardship, right, of our traditions when folks may not come with that, um, I don't want to call it, I don't even know what to call it, but almost to me, it feels like innocence, you know, for me, it was innocence. Um, and so when I see things exposed online, I feel like some people are losing their innocence or their opportunity to enter into faith with that purity and that like, um, innocence, I'm going to call it innocence for lack of a better word, but how does that change dynamics? How does that how does what what does that do for you as a godparent in terms of like what's the burden of that responsibility? I'm not sure if I understand the question correctly, but through the years, um, I have raised, if you will, my godchildren the same way that I was raised, and so the expectation is all around them when they come to social gatherings or or misas. Let's say, for example, there's a certain protocol, there's a certain thing, so the expectation is there, you know. Uh, I always tell them to ask me every and anything. I try not to be uh, too old school in the sense of you can't do this, you can't do that. I expect them to use their common sense. But if they're going to take action on something, to certainly uh, check with me first. My my uh, my found the foundation that I that I utilize with with all my godchildren is a spiritual one first. So we deal a lot with with ego first. So through through spiritual gatherings, through misas, a lot a lot of information gets 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 uh, uh, shared, uh, and also then I do a lot of individual counseling and just conversations, not anything formal, but just just conversations. So bottom line, there's an expectation because of the way I bring them in and what they see around them from people that I have brought in before. So without saying, okay, here's the list of 10 rules that you have to follow, they see it. They see it in action and everybody kind of kind of falls into place. I like to have one-on-one -on -one good relationships with my godchildren. They're also my friends and we're family. We're definitely family and we respect each other that way. So I have not had unfortunate experiences like I have heard. It's, you know, in my day, one of the many things that I was thinking about, I remember when one woman decided to leave the religion. I may have been maybe four or five years in the religion. And I thought that was like the most incredible, it affected me like someone had died. And now you hear, you know, people, you know, that they don't finish the week in the, in the, in the Ibodu and they're out, you know, <laughs> and, and all sorts of crazy things that you hear. This didn't happen in the old days because the tradition was so fixed, was so the same across the board. And again, we have just this plethora of stuff coming in 
that that causes people to say, well, I can pick from column A and, and pick from column B. I think one of the things that I see when I go to uh, religious functions um, of younger people, of younger priests and priestesses, is that informality. It becomes more of a social gathering as opposed to, you know, when the Oba is on the phone while we're doing a herbal ceremony and all sorts of crazy things. You know, there's this, this, there's this informality. So, of course, when you have that looseness, you're going to have people choosing to do whatever they want to do or not think that it's important to check with an elder. That does not occur in, in, a, in a situation in an Ocha family like mine, for example, where the expectations are laid out and they see it and they see it and they see what happens when they do things a certain way, things go well for them. So there's no reason to, to question it or to do otherwise. So Kisi, you, thank you, um, Angela. Uh, Kisi, you, you know, you, you kind of talked a little bit about something that is almost a fact of, of our lives, right? Which is that no culture is static. Culture is always changing. It's always adapting. And in fact, it adapts in order to survive, right? So how do we, how do we sort of hold that truth while also navigating, you know, some of what we've been talking about? And, and even to Angela's point, like, you know, I, Angela says, I establish expectations so people know what's expected and how we comport ourselves. And nobody deviates from that because it works, right? How do we, how do we sort of hold um, what's happening, I think, most importantly in this moment at a very accelerated pace, right? Because of the accelerated pace with which everything proliferates on the internet mm -hmm. <laughs> and through social media um, with the sort of traditional values that Angela is talking about. Um, how do we negotiate both? Like, um, and, and also I guess to this question of like maintaining the integrity of what we do um, and hold one another accountable. Angela was saying, I haven't thankfully had any unfortunate situations. One of the one of the examples, you know, that Marta and I were discussing at length when we started to prepare for this panel was, you know, that recently we'd heard sort of news in the community about pseudo initiations, for example, um, and 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 other um, sort of smaller rituals that had been. Um, created for lack of a better word <laughs> based on bits of information that people were able to obtain in public spaces right and then transferred and transmitted to unknowing novitiates right mm -hmm. so how do we how do we kind of negotiate all of the that web if you will of complexity <laughs> Um, I'm, <clears throat> I am not an EL Orisha, right? So I have not birthed uh, Orisha. I don't have godchildren in essence. I am Aljibona. So I follow the house of the, the, the godparent whose house I'm Aljibona in. And since they're got my godbrother and they follow along with what my godmother does, I'm pretty straight. <laughs> but um, so I say that to say, I haven't had those kinds of, what you mentioned, those kinds of uh, experiences either. However, it kind of, I think it goes back to something we said earlier, the importance of community, right? Um, one of the reasons why I think many of us who are in communities, long-standing, long, deeply rooted, networked, communities, right? Because it's not just one house. Houses are connected to other houses. And, you know, I, looking at the African-American community, Lukumi community in New York, for instance, I remember when everybody would come to the same ceremonies because it wasn't that many of us, right? But with the growth of the community, we now have uh, functioning houses where we don't necessarily have to go in order to make the ceremony happen, but we go because we have this connection, right? We built long-standing connections. And I think that is the one of the important things, like uh, being part of community, part of a network of houses, a community where you have witnesses, right? We all know about the witnesses. We all know people got to sign a book, right? So if you don't have, and this is, it's harder to tell uh, new people who are completely disconnected, how do they determine this, right? But this is going back to your other point with 
given the accelerated nature of where we are right now, you actually have to do something that is quite opposite of it and take your time. You know, ask the questions. Who are you? Who is your elder and your elder's elder? Take time to not only jump into going into uh, ceremonies, not just bimbes or anya, you know, well, they can't really go to anyas, but, you know, maybe go to ultra birthdays, maybe go to other things to, to start seeing, well, who is, who are these people? Who is this person that I am deciding is going to be the spiritual counsel who is going to take care of my head? Mm-hmm. Uh, I feel like sticking to the basic tenet that this practice, this tradition is communal based uh, and understanding not only this so fine, you meet this person and this person is amazing and they seem really wonderful and they want to do all of these things for you and help you reach your true authentic self. um, But who is that person in community with, right? Take the time and how do they learn? Well, what questions am I supposed to ask? Watch, you know, be in conversation with other people before you want to jump in and say, well, I deserve to get crowned. I want to make my ultra because mm-hmm. Oshun told me when I was at the river that I am supposed to be whomever or whatever. I don't mean to throw shade, but I am throwing shade. Um, be patient, you know, uh, heavy is the head that wears the crown. We all know it is not easy being an Olorisha. You know, it is not a simple, uh, you know, there's a lot of responsibility to it. So, Patience, I think, is one of the ways that we can keep to the tradition, keep to what our elders and their elders and their elders, elders pass down by being in community. It's not if you cannot or if people do not have access to other houses and other elders, then who are they and what are they doing? Did they just create this? Because, you know, we know that there are protocols into how do you have a house? You know, how can you even say you have a house? There are certain protocols that you have to follow. If a person has not gone through those things, then how can they offer these things to you? So that would be one of my, and again, this is just from my experience uh, in my house and seeing uh, what other people who have left and done all of these interesting things. um, How do you connect to community? Because this is not about one person having all of this spiritual power and then imparting this on you. Like that's not how any of this works. So. Absolutely. And I think, I mean, to your point, I think we, the, all of us on this call are very fortunate that we don't necessarily, or I, I think, because I spoke to each of you, I, we, we don't have the, the personal experience of having to engage kind of some of the atrocities. But I think the, the larger question goes to a question that we actually already have in the chat. I see um, Angela Watson on Facebook, you know, around how do we, how do we develop sort of systems of accountability, right? Regardless of you know, what our individual, or I would say um, beyond just whatever our individual obligations are, like we're all in very respected and protected religious communities and families, right? Do we have, and it's really a question, do we have an obligation to ensure the integrity um, of the religion outside of ourselves, right? I guess is a question. And Rafael, I I feel like you started to touch on a little bit about that. We have Angela Watson, before I invite you in, Angela Watson, you know, this is a, this is an idea that I've heard about for decades, you know, and I've heard people say, like, absolutely not. We're not the Vatican. This is not Catholicism. And then I've heard people say, well, but we need to organize ourselves a little more. Right. And leverage our collective power. And even going back historically, like, you know, in Cuba, for example, Cabildos are how the religion was preserved, right? Mutual aid societies that had leadership and had internal systems of organization. So the question we have from Angela is, you know, is there any talk of developing a council to kind of um, administer justice is her the word that she uses, administer justice and protocols to counter negative, you know, negativity and injustices that are occurring um, and so that's something for all three of you to just kind of think about. But Rafa, I want to invite you into the conversation around do we have 
you know, you did talk about accountability. You're like, our elders authorize us to have a public, to be in the public domain um, and in specific ways, right? Everything doesn't go on Facebook. Everything doesn't go into the public square, if you will. Um, what what systems of accountability are you bearing witness to in your community? And, and do we have an obligation? And what is the obligation? Yeah, I think we do have an obligation. Um, we all have an obligation. You know, we're all, a lot of us are just um, getting into these uh, spiritual systems hace poco, so not so long ago. Um, we all have an obligation to act right. We ha all have an obligation to teach right and follow our elders' um, teachings and guidance. We all have that uh, responsibility. In our um, family, I guess I'll call it that, right? Uh, you have, when you get initiated, you decide later if you're going to study to become an Olorisha or a Babalao or any Yanifa, etc. You have to decide that. It's not just, you don't just get initiated and pay for the initiation and all of a sudden you can do whatever you want. Like, right. I know that that happens in other traditions and, and all due respect, right? But that doesn't happen in ours. Um, you, you decide that and then you have to go through a set of oaths and, a, and, a, and other rituals, all right, which are passing. And as you learn with, you, you basically choose, like Akisi was saying, choose an elder based on what you have seen through experience and what you as a person um, investigated, I guess would be the right word, you know, because most people would want, just like we do with a doctor, would want to at least look at different uh <laughs> maybe comments about this doctor before going and trusting this person. So I think that this is even more important to, to do that. So once you pick your pick your Baba Ifa, for, for example, if you're an Awo or an Iyanifa, uh, you basically train under this person. And all and as you train, like Mari said, you get certain ashes as you go. It's not just like every, you, they just dump it all on you. You get the ashe to be able to do consultations. You get the ashe to be able to do a whole bunch of uh, different things, right? It's not just... Um, so in the sense of how it works, right? Just like Marie Nieves said, you get tested. You know, if let's see you do this. All right, I gave you the classes. We sat. You see me do it a couple of times, this and that. Let's see you do it. Oh, okay, you did that. You got to work on this. Let's see you do it again. Do this. And after you do that a bunch of times, eventually your Baba Ifa will say, you got that, you know, now I'm going to, we're going to go through this, this uh, ritual and I'm going to give you this certain chef for this. And you're going to be able to do this now in the sense of us, right? Even though we can do certain rituals and even though we have the Ashe to do certain rituals, that doesn't mean that me as an Awo, have the knowledge that has like my Baba Ifa of all the Odu. So regardless if I do the consultation, we're still calling our elders to give the messages. So right when you do that, like you're already getting like checked because it's like people know the level you're on. Plus they know who is the one giving the messages and they can go if you um, like act wrong or if you do something that's not good like they know they can literally go to the person above you and talk to that person about what's going on you know and there are repercussions there are repercussions if you don't study there are repercussions if you don't work put in the work it's 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 that simple um and that happens in everything i mean there is no way that a doctor of medical science can can graduate as a doctor and go out and do a heart open heart surgery there's just no possible way and no one would ever allow that but for some reason people allow that in the spiritual aspect and i think that that also brings up a question of faith and fear and a bunch of other things that that eventually we need to talk about right but that's basically how it happens with us um 
And those Baba Ifas have to answer to their Baba Ifas and have to answer to their Baba Ifas. So it's just like in Nigeria, there's a hierarchy. And if you are part, like, for example, if you have a, a siblings, the youngest, the there's the youngest sibling. Well, the sibling that's right above the youngest sibling in age takes care of the youngest sibling. And then they that sibling goes to the other sibling who's older. And then it goes until it gets to the parents. So the, a lot of times the parents aren't dealing with issues. The siblings are dealing with the issues. And if it's something big that needs help or, or a certain message or something, they go to the parents. And that's how it is in Ifa. So I think I, I really appreciate that intervention because it, it brings up the issue of sort of like the, the cultural values that are transmitted um, orally and through experience that don't necessarily have a rule book. Like we all know the rules, but they're not written anywhere necessarily. Right. And so I think, you know, I'm gonna a little bit, not too much, cause I actually agree with, you know, much of what you said, but I think it's important to know that in the systems, they actually do mirror one another. You know, the example that you give about Nigerian, um, Ifa or Ifa that is actively currently practicing Yoruba land, right. Is, is quite similar to what the traditional values of the Lukumi system have been. And even in Candomblé, in Candomblé, you're a Yawo for seven years, right? And then every several years, you have another obligation, a ritual obligation that then authorizes you to the next step, right? Mm -hmm. And you also have you also have ritual functions that are assigned, you know, which in the Lukumi system we have as well, even though we don't necessarily classify them in the same way. So in Brazil, you know, you have a, the Balogunes might only do sacrifice and the Alabes are only doing drumming, similar to our Omoanya, right? And so there are ritual functions and there are ritual hierarchies, I think, mm -hmm. um, in the Lukumi system as well. But all of that stuff is, is transmitted and it's also checked, right? It's also like folks are, are held in their place by their elders. But if you have the phenomenon that Angela is talking about where, you know what, I got my initiation, I'm out. I'm going to go do my thing. This new culture of informality. This also this culture of transience, right? Because like the way that I was raised, it's like your elders are your elders for your whole life. So you better make sure you pick them well, <laughs> you know, um, and, 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 and you engage with them like, you know, hopefully like a functional family, right? When differences um, arise or tensions or you know, misunderstanding, then you engage because you love each other, you're committed to each other, and you're also bound ritually. You have an obligation to to engage, right? And to to and, not, and to be clear, I'm not suggesting that we hold on to dysfunctional families, but I am suggesting that if we choose our elders well, then we could be in an active practice of like growing together and getting through the hard times when they arise, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I guess, you know, a little bit that we, we haven't really gone there yet, but Malta and I, you know, Malta was really interested. I'll say that I was kind of interested and I am interested, but Malta is really, really interested. And I think we all touched on it a little bit is like, you know, outside of what this does to us internally in our community, this also has like external ramifications in terms of the economy, in terms of, you know, um, you know, what is possible in terms of not just the economy, but the quality of relationships, right? Which is the thing that Angela was talking about. There can be, you know, we live in capitalism and in capitalism, if you pay for something, it's yours, <laughs> right? You buy it, you pay for it, you get it, it becomes yours. There's ownership. Um, and I think like that some of those values, of course, like seep into our interactions with one another when folks feel like, A, I now have more access because this thing is everywhere. Mm -hmm. These traditions are everywhere. And if I have money, I could pay for something and it's mine. And so if I finish my yaburaje, I'm a priest and now I can do whatever I want. Well, guess what? In, traditionally in our in Lukumi, right? We haven't been able to. And Rafa, you just said in, in Nigeria, you're not able to either. Your, your elders still authorize you to things, right? Um, but what happens if, if the values change? What happens if it actually does become, I paid for this, I got it, it's mine. And now, you know, there isn't the collective accountability, right? That we've all sort of been raised in. How does that change the culture? Mata was talking about commodities. What happens when Ocha or Ifa or the Loa, you know, the Orishais in Brazil 
what happens when these systems and their material representations become commodities, right? Um, I always talk about, before you respond, I always say like a lot of aesthetically our religions are very rich. So people see elekes, right? Or they see a dance class or they hear music and that's very attractive and people want that, right? Mm -hmm. um, but what they don't know is that behind the curtain is a lot of sweat, right? It's a lot of, a lot of labor. It's a lot of collective labor. Um, and so what happens? I think Akisi, you were about to respond. Um, I think it's long been commodities. You know, it, this is not new. Uh, it, it's in, in, in terms of the different aspects, right? It might have proliferated in a particular kind of way because of, you know, the internet and now social media and now with the added um, pressure of it being introduced to other people outside of the practice, but it has long been commodified and the different aspects of the religion have long been commodified, you know, um, in different ways. And, you know, the thing about it being capitalism and it's this particular thing of late capitalism and I'm doing a little egghead thing real quick here. It's this little particular thing of late capitalism in which everyone is a brand. Right. Every individual is a brand. Every individual is an empire and a business onto itself. And therefore, they have to turn whatever it is. Uh, they're encouraged to turn whatever it is that is them into uh, monetize, you know, monetize that thing. You know, so if I am seen or if I see myself as a healer, I am going to monetize that in a particular kind of way because that is just the nature of this stage of capitalism. Doesn't mean that everybody does it, but it, that's just the nature of this stage of capitalism. And so, you know, I, I part of me, I, I kind of don't want to do the gloom and doom thing because we have a tendency to do that. And it's it, it, it makes sense. It's understandable. However, there are still very much those uh, many communities and houses and, 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 and networks of houses and communities who continue to carry the traditions and the values as they were learned, right? Um, there is always going to be a shift and a change because you have more people now who are introduced. You have more people who are outside who are now learning about this. And as these as these new people uh, are being introduced, you're going to have some who are going to be brought into the fold, some who are going to learn how these communities who hold on to these traditions, they're going to continue to to develop those kinds of values. And then you're going to have the people who don't, right? Um, again. The anthropologist is so there's the anthropologist in me and then there's the practitioner in me. The anthropologist in me understands that and and sees that and understands that that's, that's just part of the again the development of human beings of human culture. The practitioner in me is a little nervous because of what happens when the things that I knew um, are changing. But tra all tradition was created at some point, right? All tradition went from one thing to another at some point. And so we are at the moment. And again, I'm not saying that there aren't issues. There absolutely are. Again, the anthropologist in me versus the practitioner in me, right? Um, however, I, I think that with this late stage of capitalism where people are commodifying things, um, there is, I feel like there are enough people who are not commoditizing um, I feel like there are, if we can each sit on here and, and we each can point to 10 other people who can say, that's not how we do it in our house. You know, we follow tradition. Then that's something that really is something that's something that will spread. Um, that is something that you'll, you'll always, you'll, will always have those people who fall outside of the fray, you know, but we still will always have the core who holds on to what they've learned, you know, who's hold on to my elder taught me this and her elder taught me this and their elder taught them that. So because of that, I'm going to follow with what I, you know, with what I learned. And so for me, the issue is not necessarily the distinction between those who hold this core versus those who are outside and just are running rampant, doing crazy egregious stuff. 
my interest is in within that core, let's not act like there's not division within that. Let's not act like that there's not, well, you're doing this wrong. And, you're, you know, even though I learned from my elder and I was taught to follow the elder and their elder taught them that and then their elders taught them that. But then there are people who are now saying, but what you're doing is wrong. Right. So that for me, that's more of the the real issue. Right. The kind of internal division for those of us who do try to hold on to tradition and acknowledge those places where tradition is not um, it's 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 not stable. Right. It, it's 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 arguable. Right. It's debatable. There are people say, well, that's not how this is done and that's not how this is done. But yet elders who have uh, 50 years, 80 years or what have you have taught that thing that's now being challenged. So that for me, that's more interesting than those on the outside who I feel are doing the egregious stuff. Mm -hmm. So I think, I mean, well, I'm not even going to ask a question. I want to, I want to kind of re uplift again, Angela Watson's question about, so then what do we do about that? If at all, is there an intervention? Um, is the intervention in your house, like to Akisi's point, is it an internal intra kind of intervention where you focus on who's in your house, your family, your immediate community, and and sort of um, continue to be in dialogue and, and hold folks accountable there? Or is there a public facing um, system of accountability or response, right? Um, because I think one of the tensions for me, and I'm not gloom and doom either, because you know I have the blessing of elders and and community, right? That we we sort of hold each other and engage about this. Like one of my concerns, though, I think is that what happens? It's like um, it, I'm going to use a culinary example. I was somewhere, and you know they were talking about the differences in how people make pasteles, right? Which is like a Puerto Rican Christmas thing. Right, it's like plantain and plantain leaves, and you stuff it with whatever meat you like. And then some people put garbanzos or raisins, and some people don't. And if you use garbanzos or raisins, that's like a polemic, right? If you use, you're either a raisin person or you're not a raisin person, right? But we all agree that like pasteles are a Puerto Rican Christmas tradition, even if we don't agree about the raisins. Well, I was somewhere where somebody was like, "Oh, pasteles are Dominican," and I was like, "See, I'm not gonna fight you about raisins." But I am going to fight you about the origin of pasteles because we all know, you know, my Dominican people have their traditions and they're different. And but there's migration. Right. And there are Dominicans in Puerto Rico and there are Puerto Ricans that go to the Dominican Republic. So culture is moving. And so maybe they are Dominican now, too. Right. Like the question of cultural ownership is like, well, who gets to decide that? Right. But. If we don't, you know, if we can hold that, who gets to decide that, right? That culture is changing and it's moving and there's migration and there are all these different factors that play into this and we're in late state capitalism to your point. Who, how do we, or do we, again, it's, it's really like a, I think, a, you know, an existential question. <laughs> do we, what happens when all the people in the fray, right, to use your terminology, are now leading the conversation, right? because they have access to so the, the elders that I know that are the wisest and most knowledgeable don't even have social media. Right. So the wisdom, the benefit of that wisdom is literally only going to be had if you're sitting face to face with them or on a phone call. It's not going to be on Facebook. It's not going to be on Twitter. It's not going to be in, you know, Instagram. What happens though, when the people with the loudest voice are not necessarily the people with the most knowledge. Um, and I want to invite Angela or Rafael um, into, and I just want to shout out Allende, Allensco, who's in the chat and is like, hello, we have pasteles in Trinidad too. Um, <laughs> me and my people, this is what I'm talking about, right? Cultural pluralism. And yes, I do know y'all have parang as well, like parranda, that's right. Um, but, you know, to go back to the discussion, um, Angela and Rafael, I don't know, do you have any like immediate reactions? Please rephrase the question. Yeah. So, what do we do? We do we stick to kind of managing our own ilés, our own communities, or do we have a public-facing responsibility in kind of managing the dynamics of this moment? I'll I'll, I'll speak for for myself. I can only I can only um, have expectations 
of the people that at some level I'm responsible for, if you will. And those people are going to respond to me accordingly. So uh, for me to go to Doña Juana's house over there and, and have an opinion, it, it's not going to be accepted, first of all. So it's not, it's not practical. And I think what's going to happen is that you're going to continue to have groups that are going to go this way and groups that are going to go that way. And the religion and the traditions are going to evolve in different ways. We have to remember, and I always do, you know, when, 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 uh, when our ancestors came here, when the slaves came here, they couldn't find this. They couldn't find what a phone. They had to use eggshells. They couldn't, you know, so we're talking about survival here and adaptation of survival, but the basic foundation of the traditions stayed in. And more than anything, we haven't talked about it is the whole concept of ancestors and, and, and respect for the ancestors and the tradition of the ancestors. So in that, that's the context, that's kind of like my foundation. But I, I can't see myself, if someone comes to me from the outside and says, listen, I need help this, that, and the other, and they have an elder, I would, I would feel comfortable speaking to that elder and saying, listen, this person came to me from your house. I can't advise them whether they should leave the house or not, or whether they should do X, Y, or Z, but may I recommend that? You know, I could see myself doing that, but my responsibility is the people that have learned and have evolved and have become initiated through me, and, and I have a vested interest in them, and they have a vested in, in, interest in the house and maintaining the house uh, as it is. So I think it, it's unfortunate, but uh, it's, I don't think it's gonna happen. Um, you know, uh, so I think it starts within La Casa, right? I think it starts within your house and setting an example, but amongst the different, uh, ramas, right? The different, uh, styles of practicing, um, there are councils, you know, in Nigeria, there are councils, uh, in Cuba, there's a council and here in Puerto Rico, there's a council, um, here in Puerto Rico, uh, the council basically just works with La Letra del Año. And we had a reunion. Uh, I'm part of a, a Babalao chat here with a bunch of different Babalao's elders as well. And it's in WhatsApp. So maybe that's why they all have they all have WhatsApp. Right. Uh, but, you know, we, we had this discussion. We had a couple meetings and stuff about it. And basically, they made it clear that they work on the Letra del Año, and that's what they do. So mm -hmm. we were trying to form, like, another thing, and we'd had a couple meetings and stuff, but it just didn't formulate too much, you know? Mm -hmm. We started delegating work, and then people, you know, weren't doing work, and it just kind of, like, faded away there. Mm -hmm. But there, you know, to answer the question in the in the chat, right, in the comments that, that some of the viewers were having, and also in my, what I what I feel, I think it's important to 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 see it like that, that there are councils and there are ways to to contact these councils, you know, and these councils definitely. Um, I guess I don't want to say call out, but they definitely bring to attention certain things that are happening within certain houses or within or certain elites. Right. And then we have I mean, in New York, I know we have the egg bays. Right. And across across the country, I think there are egg bays, right, that also organize around their tutelary orisha or mm -hmm. other functions. Um, I think, you know, I think y'all are really I just want to kind of uplift the point that that we are also like while we have bodies um, that bring us together for a particular purpose from time to time, we are also decentralized. Right. So it, it isn't a binary necessarily. It isn't. It, 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 there's a lot that lives in between those two realities, right? It isn't an either or. Um, and I think, you know, I don't know, I'd love to hear from y'all, like, as you've listened to one another and Angela, I love that you came in, you know, with this reflection of like, before I came here, I really had to think back to the 1970s, right? Because we literally just got like 50 years worth of wisdom and reflection. Um, what do you hear or what do you what do you feel or what are your kind of reflections as you've listened to one another? Like, I want to actually move to the panel to say, what questions do you have or what curiosities um, do you have as you've listened to one another and been in discussion with each other here tonight? 
I don't know. I think we're very much on the same page to a great degree, you know, each with our own little facet in, in terms of, of, of uh, you know, where we're at from the anthropological side, from the IFA side, and from the practitioner side. Uh, but we're kind of, we, we, I, I would say we're in sync. I, I don't think that there's anything that um, we practice, we believe, we have a, a, a view about that's that's different and and i like the fact that we're you know in different parts of the the world and we practice differently but we're on the we're kind of like on the same page in terms of respect in terms of eldership and in terms of uh of of practice and traditions i definitely think we're on the same page any other thoughts before i go to the chat um, you know, I guess my, my question, I guess would be to Ia Angela is like when, you know, in your casa or in, in that, in the spiritual practice, when do you feel, um, that the training starts to become like an Olorisha or a priest or a priestess? Like when do you, when is kind of like the, or is it different for every person who comes in, depending on uh, practice and? and it's study? it's not different in that I I I I, uh, I train, if you will, or I educate or I share information the way it was for me. I had a very short period of time. I I, I decided to make Ocha in February, and I made Ocha in May. So it was a very short period of time. So they really ran me through the the, the, the stuff, and then and then so I kind of worked backwards. But in, in the case of my godchildren now, I saw the importance of the grounding in Egu ancestors before. So my godchildren develop their 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 ancestral line and know who they are, know where they all of that happens and, and you know we definitely have the spiritual coronation and all of that be, before just so the grounding the grounding is egu, the grounding is ancestor, you know. That kind of takes them to, well, well okay, I think I want to make, make Oche. My husband's a la la la. So, okay, let's, let's go get a reading with, uh, and get your head marked. Before, we didn't do that in my house because we didn't work with Baba Laos. But now, now that my husband's a la la, we do. And so then, okay, so then we go to Ifa. And then Ifa determines X, Y, Y, Z. And then, and then we go from there. But definitely a grounding in the ancestors. Got to know your ancestors, got to gotta develop your spirit guides and do all that spiritual work before before we begin on the road to, to Ocha. And for some people, I mean, it hasn't been the case, but for some people it may not be and they just kind of want to stay there, maybe just get a leckies, you know, not necessarily get initiated. And I don't push it. You know, everybody mm -hmm. everybody's on their own track based on their own decision and the, their own ideas and whatever it is they want to do. Thank you, Ia. Sure. Any other questions or reflections? I just love listening to um, Ia Angela's uh, experience. Like it's when you said the year you were made was the year my godmother was made, and so it's it's um, it's refreshing. It's it's comforting um, that we all are all are in different places at different stages and from different perspectives still on the same page, which bring, you know, which is what I was saying earlier that, yeah, that other stuff is a problem. Absolutely. No doubt. We need to deal with that. But this is what gives me comfort. You know, mm. it's, it's like knowing that the tradition that was lovingly shared with me, I'm, you know, I'm blessed to be an Olorisha, you know, I'm, 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 lucky i'm like i don't know how people do this life without this um and to to know that while things are changing like there are still that thing is still this beautiful thing that still exists um that people are holding it as treasures and therefore are doing everything they can including this conversation um to make sure that the its integrity remains intact so i i thank you ia um for sharing your experience. My pleasure. And I thank all of you, all three of you. Thank you so much for being in dialogue. Um, I want to go to the chat a bit. We have, and I, and I also want to say to the viewing audience that we do actually have um, some boundaries around 
some the types of questions that will field on the panel because we we understand that they're like and, and it's very common we understand that there's a really wide range of sort of a landscape if you will of audience members and that some people are seeking personal um support or or connection um to build their own relationships and seek out elders and such and and because we are a cultural institution we actually try to draw somewhat of a line between kind of engaging in a dialogue that is open for people at all levels and 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 going to people's like personal needs getting into people's personal needs so i want to just honor you by saying that we see you and also mm -hmm. say that this may not be the space for all of the questions um but i do see several questions about monetization so we're back to money <laughs> to the point of late stage capitalism um you know we have someone in the chat um, enith valdez who's talking about and there were a couple of other comments who's kind of talking about the fact that for some folks, the religions, plural, are a way to monetize and make money, right? And then for some folks, they are a place of deep religious belief, right? And, and, and there's, a, there's a different level or different type of commitment that is not exclusively tied to money. Um, and then we also have a question related to money that's really around like the communities having to navigate um, large varying costs. Right. And so, you know, both I think these questions are very relevant for folks that are active practitioners, folks on this call, but also, you know, in terms of that external kind of like what the public what's happening in, in public life, if you will. I think these are important questions because, you know, one of the things that that we we see when we have contact with different types of communities and the, the you know, CJI and Marta, for example, are often you know, contacted for people that have experienced pseudo initiation or are trying to find elders or are trying to experiencing some of these challenges is sort of like, how do we, and I think we kind of started a baseline because there are people in our, in our sort of audience who don't even understand why you have to pay a derecho or, or offer money as an offering um, to begin with. So I, I would love someone first to answer that. Mm -hmm. And then also for the audience to make the distinction around what is the difference between paying a derecho in quotes, offering a wall, right? Money as mm -hmm. a form of offering, but also as a resource that is used in a resource rich tradition mm -hmm. versus people quote unquote, making money off of the religion or monetizing the religion. And I think that there is a distinction because we are a religion that requires, all of our religions require a lot of resources, material resources. So I would love for someone on the panel to first answer that um, for the viewers. Let, let me say this. When I went to make Ultra, my godfather sat down with me and we, put, we talked about the expenses. At the time, at the time when I made Ultra, uh, with a local, because I have you in Miami, I went in with a local, was 2005 for everything. Everything. Not, not, not my clothing and not, and not my, my pots, but, but for everything. And my godfather sat with me and says, this is for the animals, this is for the herbs, this is for this, this is for that. You're going to have 12 people working, you have to rent the place. And he broke it down for me. And that's what I do with my godchildren. I said, okay, we're going to need this much as a working capital. And this is, this is how it breaks down. And some got children say, Marina, please don't. I give them receipts. For, if, if it's something that I purchase or I have made, I give them receipts for everything so that they know where the money is going. So that I think that got children or people should know where their money is going and how it's being spent. And we do that. There's this, so there's the religious side of it, but this is practical. I can't make the clothes. I can't buy the fabric. I can't grow the herbs. I have to pay somebody and I, they have to ship them from Puerto Rico or Florida, whatever the case may be. So there's a breakdown of course that they know. My godchildren know what the expectation is in terms of money. As far as derechos, I go with the traditional derechos in terms of, of, of what to charge for this, that, and the other. But I always tell my godchildren, whatever, if it, to me, whatever you can afford, because this isn't about money. I don't need, thank God, I don't need this to live on. 
I don't need this to pay the rent. I don't need this to buy food. So th there is a derecho, and, and I, you know, it would, it, I, I would be doing something wrong if I didn't charge a derecho because that's the way it was done, and I'm, I have, I have the responsibility to keep that tradition. But then again, if somebody is tight, give it to me later, or give me half, or give me what you can, you know. So that's that's the way we work. Not everybody works that way. But I'm saying honesty and, and uh, what expenses are. I mean, in New York, let's take, for example, I'm in Florida now, but I was born and raised in New York. The flower industry, the fabric industry, the bead industry, if it wasn't for our religion, there would be a marked difference in that economy. Hello. So... Yes, things cost money, a lot of stuff. I, I remember beads only came from Czechoslovakia back in the day. Mm -hmm. You know, that kind of thing. So, so, so yeah. So there, there's costs, then, then there's costs, and then there's the flexibility that you work with. Yeah, I think that uh, transparency is super important, like Ia said. Mm -hmm. um, most people who who decide to do like either get initiated or not a lot of people kind of have already like quote unquote shopped around right and i think mm -hmm. that nowadays is a it's a big thing that that thing about shopping around and i think it's because of society right like how we live and like you know being able to get on amazon or ebay and get whatever you wanted to get off the website a little bit cheaper mm -hmm. I think that that's a huge thing and people do that even here. So if people do that, even with like getting your teeth fixed, like they're going to do that with <laughs> spirituality. I mean, there's no like if you your front tooth isn't there, like you're going to like call around and find out that's that's how it's done. Right. Um, but I think it's important what he, uh, Angela said that, you know, amongst your like family or or Ile, like it's important you know to be very transparent you know and even when people come in from outside it's super important to be very transparent this is how we do it this is the cost because animals don't grow on trees the <laughs> herbs like i live in the city right like you may live in new york city you can't have a garden of herbs in your backyard That's right. That's right. um and and not only that but how, like I keep going back to the doctor thing or the or lawyer professional thing. Like a lot of people who've been doing, uh, like for example, the uh, and I have many years and many years of study. So that is, it's it's an actual like job. Like regardless if you need the money or not, and that's something you have to respect. It's just like us musicians. People don't want to pay us. People people don't respect like the the trade, right? And this is that mm -hmm. like. It doesn't matter what religion we're talking about. Every single religion, there's an exchange. So if you're Catholic, you have to pay whatever, 10% of your whole year's salary plus, you know, and, and Jewish and all these different things. So it's just, it's it's how you, you, you speak about it and how you explain it and how really transparent you are, you know. And that's what I think the most important thing is because a lot of people come to us saying, well, the guys here in PR, they want to charge me 25000 and you guys are saying it's 3500 mm -hmm. And we're going with you. And I'm like, you don't go with someone because it's cheaper. You go with someone because that's part of your casa and that's how they do it. Like, you don't just go away from your house to get initiated with someone else because you don't have the money. Unless you're going to explain it to your elders and say, listen, I... You know, I can't pay this. I'm going to go over to, you know, Rafa or I'm going to go over to these people's place and we're going to get initiated there. Then you talk it over with your elders. Right. <laughs> but, you know, I think I think the the whole, you know, the way we view things and the way we shop is definitely something that is seen in within our traditions like a lot. Yeah. And I think I think the way to your point, the way that we value other people's labor Right. right? Yeah. Um, because I recently, I recently had an experience. I was in an initiation in Miami where, you know, to Akisi's point, even though we all practice the same thing, the different regionalisms, right? And the specificity of place mean that we're going to have different influences that, that color 
how it is expressed, right? And and I, you know, I'm from New York City, born and raised like Angela. I'm from New York City, and I think every initiation I've ever attended in the 20 years that I've had Obata La Crown, I've probably gotten the same derecho for 20 years, <laughs> you know? It's like, let's just say it's the same $5 for the last 20 years, <laughs> right? And so you put in, you know, 12, 14 hours of labor, right? For initiation, and it's we've accustomed ourselves to, you know, it's it's symbolic, it's this and it's that, right? But something that I experienced in Miami, which was it wasn't it wasn't in a way that felt materialistic or transactional at all, but that I was like, oh yeah, like they've retained the integrity of everything, and they are also responding to people's needs, right? In two different ways, it was like one, the derecho was higher. But it was higher and it was higher for everyone. Right. And the, and the way that the derechos were organized, they ensured that all the participating priests left with the same amount of money. So one, there was a commitment to equity, right? Mm -hmm. and, and often, you know, you, the people who are doing a lot of hard labor are just doing it because that's what they committed to doing, not because they're being compensated monetarily for that labor. Right. So there was a commitment to equity that was conscious. And I found that really interesting and beautiful. And then the other thing was that it was pragmatic. Right. Because it's Miami and people have to drive long distances and they got to pay for gasoline. Right. And gasoline is expensive right now. So, you know, in my house, yeah, we have a commitment. You know, it's cultured at the end of the, of the long initiation day. You give people extra cab money and you make sure everybody's taking food. Right. These are our customs. But I, I found this so interesting to witness this very systematized um, approach that was also very consciously pragmatic and, and consciously committed to equity and like valuing everyone's actual labor, right? Because behind the scenes, and I keep saying it and I'm gonna be a broken record about it, it's a lot of sweat, blood and tears, <laughs> good tears, bad tears, all the kinds of tears, right? It's labor and it's, it is a labor of love, right? But all of the people in our community that to Rafa's point are, are doing this labor, have study behind them, have apprenticeship behind them, have you know a commitment to helping and improving the lives of others behind them. And, and those are things, and I will say something we haven't talked about, and there's the, the, the added feature that what we do is like spiritual, religious, and metaphysical transformation, right? It's energy exchange, and so, People that do things on your behalf have to now go and do things on their own behalf in order to, to maintain their spiritual health so mm -hmm. that they can continue to help others, right? So I think that's a really important, you know, distinction to make, um, particularly in this thread that we have around like monetiz monetization um, and money. Um, and so I see some other questions in the chat and I'm, I'm gonna go to them. Um, and it's an, a really interesting question from Ayensko, which is, where have we begun to see investment in infrastructure, right, that resonate with our spiritual system? So other examples of that that he gives are like halal butchers or community gardens and food sovereignty work, right, food justice, Um has anyone seen examples or models? You know, I know I know of some Brazilian folk in upstate New York that have a tejero, you know, where they, they've kind of used their home and a piece of land to start to build out all of the things that they would need for their religious community. And I've heard of some folks trying to do that in the south of the United States where there's more land, right? But have folks heard of other models or economic kind of models that, that build infrastructure for our religion outside of like the local botanica? Not yet, not yet, not really. I mean, I know that there are people that do beadwork and clothing and stuff like that and and do it, that's all they do. You know, they do it specifically for the religion, but as far as branching out, uh, I know here in Florida, there's many more people that have a lot of, 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 uh, of uh, herbs, growing in their backyard and this kind of thing. But as far as formalizing it, 
into a business, if you will, uh, I don't know of it myself. The things that I've seen, like you mentioned, uh, in the South, you know, I know folks in uh, North Carolina and Maryland and <clears throat> Georgia, um, Atlanta, not those other folks, <laughs> but um, who are attempting to kind of go back to our roots, right, in a, in a certain way and, 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 and build out the, like you said, how um, the folks, I think you said upstate New York, who are building out a, a, a candomblé to head them, right? Um, trying to do the same thing in the South, because realizing even though that the tradition uh, thrived in urban context, right, for much of Lukumi tradition, um, mm -hmm. at least, have thrived in urban context, as in candomblé as well, in many ways, um, it's it's becoming more and more difficult, you know? And so uh, that's what, you know, some of my research is on as well. Like how are people adapting to the changes in the cities? And many for us are saying, well, maybe the city thing really ain't it. Maybe it's really time to give back to, you know, our roots in a particular way in the South where you can have more land and therefore do more things and 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 build out and, and uh, grow the herbs and and have land to actually grow lots of herbs to be able to provide for a community um, as opposed to always having to, which is not a bad thing that we utilize uh, people who sell herbs. I think that's a great way of building community across, you know, borders and across states and what have you. But it's also important to learn how to become self-sustaining in a particular kind of way. And I feel like there are people whose minds are uh, going towards that, again, as a form of adaptation, you know, not shunning what has been done, but realizing like it's, you know, in New York City, rent is too damn high, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And rent is too high everywhere, you know? And so therefore, what do we, how do we adapt in that situation? How do we uh, continue to have our traditions um, and deal with costs? Right. In a particular kind of way. Um, somebody asked in the, in the chat if there could be standardized costs. I don't think it could be standardized in a sense because it depends on where you are. You know, an, an ultra ceremony in Brooklyn is going to look different than an ultra ceremony in North Carolina, rural North Carolina, which is going to look different from an ultra ceremony in, in Havana. Right. And so because of that, the costs are different. And so what I am seeing are people thinking about uh, doing things a little bit differently that really does kind of harken to a longer ago past. Yeah, can I add something, Mari? To, yeah, thank you. I think it's important to move to this, um, you know, raising animals, growing our own herbs, like making our own medicines and stuff so that we can make it even more accessible to those people who aren't able to pay for a $300 Ebo. So mm -hmm. what we have been seeing, you know, especially here in Puerto Rico, is that it's hard to, to for, you know, the right normal person to, to practice IFA, you know, and, and that's, I think, something we have to think about already, like, uh, and I think it's super important just the fact on who is practicing and, and, and how are they able to cost certain things, you know, or how deep in the hole are they getting themselves into just to know their destiny, mm -hmm. which is super important. But you don't have to get into the hole like, you know, tens of thousands of dollars to know that. And it's, it's, it's almost contraproducente, a lot of things that are happening. So I think that one thing that's important is, is growing our own herbs and is uh, raising our own animals. And luckily, uh, my main teacher, Baba Jose Rodriguez Agbola, moved to Puerto Rico uh, not so long ago. And he bought a really nice property um, and with a lot of space and we were already like growing different herbs. Uh, we already have two OB trees and I don't know if they're like OB trees in Puerto Rico. Like we use coconut a lot here, you know, to like what Iyang had, I was mentioning. Um, but actually having OB growing in Puerto Rico again, or maybe for the first time we're going to start or Ogbo, et cetera. 
Um, and eventually these type of these herbs and, and animals and all these different materials are going to be uh, readily available to other Awo, regardless of what a tradition you practice, whether it be um, Lukumi or, or, or Isheshe or Epiritim or any of the different uh, practices that happen here and around the world. So I think that it's very important that we all get on that um, on that work uh, in some way, whether it be a local garden, kind of like teaming up with like a local organic garden or whatever and being like, hey, why don't you grow amaranth? You know, <laughs> like, why don't you grow Bledo Blanco? You know, the most important herb. Why don't, you know, and then you, and they see, oh, I can use this for teas or whatever, but we use it for certain other things. So I think that it's really important to move in this direction, um, mainly to have the these practices accessible to everyone yeah and i think you know we have a question in the chat around like how do we uplift the ethics right and integrity that are at the heart of all we do and i think that that point is deeply connected because you know i i was having a conversation recently in spanish we have the word cabildeo right which is like the the noun attached to mutual aid right? The act of mutually giving and taking and building cooperatively. Um, I think what you're talking about in addition to self-sustainability, right, is, is also this idea of like, how do we build resources that are shared and collectivized, right, to support the things that we need to do. And I think during the pandemic in particular, where there was a moment where you weren't gonna get the herbs shipped from Miami, right? Everything stopped in the United States religiously for a moment um, where there wasn't access to animals and farms and there wasn't access to herbs. And all of a sudden, you know, if you didn't have a yard with herbs or things, that, you know, materials, I, I laugh because half of my kitchen is, uh, is like an ultra stock room. <laughs> and I was like, well, damn, I'm really glad I got that there. You know, I'm really glad that I, I, <laughs> I was planning ahead and I was raised to have you know, the stockpile of materials, if it goes down, we've got some things here. Um, but I think, you know, we are used to, socially, we are used to um, the marketplace, right? We're used to just being able to go out to the store, order it on Amazon, or walk down to the Botanica. And, and we're in a world that, you know, beyond religion, in a world that's changing radically very quickly, right? Due to climate and, and due to so many other factors. And so... You know, how do we prepare ourselves for that? How do we build the infrastructure that Ayensko is talking about, um, but also kind of center this principle of cabildeo, right, of mutual aid, um, so that we can continue, you know, to, for folks that are viewing, Rafael is saying, like, the economic, you know, there, there's an issue of economic access for people in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is poorer than the state of Mississippi, right? It's a colonial territory. Um, Mississippi is the poorest state in the United States and Puerto Rico is poorer than Mississippi. So to go into Puerto Rico and, you know, expect folks to, even though we have a need to purchase material items, to, to have the expectation that people can purchase those items um, is actually unrealistic for most people, for the common person. Um, and then, you know, I think the other side of the cabildeo piece is like when I was growing up and I, I imagine Angela when you were initiated and, and Akisi when you were growing up, like, you know, it wasn't just the marketplace wasn't actually out in the world. It was actually people that you called. And there was, we had a metal worker who you would call, I need the bracelets and the herramientas. And then you had a seamstress or a, you know, a tailor. And then you had the herb man and you had the animal man, right? So it's an underground economy also it was, it was. Um, yes, it was. That, that we participate in. So how do we rebuild those networks? I was um I was on Etsy the other day and I was just like, oh, casually, like, let me see what they have on here. I'm curious to see what an Etsy Ocha market looks like. And it was like $95 for an Ocha skirt. And I was like, wow, you know, shout out to Etsy for <laughs> raising the prices of Ocha skirts, you know? Um, and to think this used to be the tradition of enslaved. And here we are, you know? Exactly. Exactly. Um, so I don't know. We have about 20 minutes, and I want to invite the audience. We haven't seen too, too much activity from our viewing audience.
But we want to invite y'all to more questions to close us out. Um, we have the great privilege of having Angela and Akisi and Rafael with us. And so if you are with us on Facebook or YouTube, please do put your questions and comments in the chat. We want to bring you into the conversation. Yeah, I think there's a, a question here from the ethics and the integrity that are all that are El Fundamento. Yeah, so I think I, I, I brought that in and I'll, thank you for bringing it back is how do we intentionally lift the ethics and integrity that are at the heart of what we do? In I think context. that it's important to focus on on that really like about you know in at least in Ifa right the two main things in Ifa that you're going to be asked I guess in heaven or judged for right in heaven is did you better your character or say did you become a better person throughout this this uh, journey and did you leave this place a better place than you found it So I think that if we start like educating, like with that premises, like just with that uh, idea on like, first of all, we have to work on our character. We have to get better. We have to help others and stuff. And then like we pay less attention to like, you know, coyotes and like ritualistic stuff. That's great. It's all like fun and all that. But I think that the most important thing really is, like how we're becoming better people and how we're helping each other and how we're by uh, giving people opportunity to know their destiny, right? Uh, how they become better people and how they help other people and make this world a better place. So I think that a lot of times, like we deviate things like because people want that, like, oh, I want to do drumming. Like a lot of us got into certain things because of that or got into it because, oh, I like coyotes or I like this or I like being in something kind of like, you know, uh, that's different, right, from other things. So, but I think that even with those people, we need to bring them back to like, listen, like the core to this is this, like, you know, mm -hmm. like, yeah, we can drum and we can go, you know, we can go to all the tambores and we can, you know, do all that, but what's what are you doing or what's what are you building to make this happen you know and i think that once we start that as a fundamental as a fundamental like part of building then we can build a huge like quote unquote empire like over that you know of people helping other people and people making this world a better place so i think it is about just like ingraining that those like core concepts of and it doesn't matter what what tradition you practice whether it be muslim all of them are the same when, when we're talking about this like getting better and helping other people and they get better and we everyone's getting better and becoming a better place and i think that that's important i think that it's also important to to mention that you know we have to be better with the earth as well like we can't just like sit here and be like oh like our you know we have to be doing better stuff for the earth you know because <laughs> this is where we live and this is what we're passing on to our kids. So, you know, I, I don't want to take too much time, but that's my opinion on that. Um, yeah. Thank you, Rafa. Are there other reflections? I think the work that I, that I do with, with my godchildren, the relationship that I have with them is very much in, in, in line with what the, With, with Rafa saying, uh, it's about becoming a better person. It's about uh, influencing other people. And it gives me such great joy when I see the younger God children kind of going from point A to point B and, and it working for them and they embracing more and, and this, this type of thing. This is a way of life for me. It's the way I wake up, it's the way I go to sleep, it's what I eat, it's what I don't eat and why I don't eat it. You know, and so this is the example that I put forward there. And, and uh, if you're going to look at this, like, oh, there's a restriction and I can't do this. or it's, it's not that it's for your own good. And so if you present the information, if you present the concept, you know, when I go over readings with, with, with my godchildren, this is why this is. And we try it and we go step by step. It's a step by step process. And it is a life process. I'm 78 years old and I'm still learning and I'm still growing and I intend to do so. 
and I continue to do so. And that's the example that I give forward to, to my godchildren. <laughs> We're trying to get a hold of you, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, because my screen now is um, my screen now is blank. Somebody was actually calling my husband because I'm using his computer, so I don't know if I'm going to be able to because I don't even know what to press and I don't know how it happened. We but see and hear you perfectly. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So as long as you see and hear me, I'll just I'll just look at his okay. screensaver. I'll be okay with the screensaver. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to lose I know you. you're there. I know you're there. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Angela. I think you, you know, we, we still have, so for folks maybe that have joined us later, we have a question from Ayoka Wiles. And there's a lot of energy, I want to say, a lot of energy in the chat still about whether a council of elders might work in our community and how we will organize that across the diaspora. And so Ayoka, if you joined us a bit later, um, our panelists actually have responded to this. Um, and, and we invite you to maybe come back to that part of the conversation um, after, you know, after, the, after we conclude. Um, but I think I wanna kind of take all, all of us back to the very beginning of this conversation, which is around how technology facilitates connection, teaching, learning, transmission. Um, because I think one, you know, we're talking about this point around integrity and ethics and character fundamentally, right? And how we transform as people through these traditions and how we bring people in and how we hold them when they're here. I guess what I'd love to hear from y'all is, you know, what, because we do have a couple of folks in the chat kind of seeking out parameters for eldership. I want to I want to broaden the question though a bit and say how do we or ask you how do we um establish or what are your established? I'm going to personalize it further. What are your established regardless of whether you're you know Ialocha, Awo, Oyubon, Akan, whatever your roles are or have been what are your standards around the process of teaching, learning, and apprenticeship for yourself and for, for people who you may touch, regardless of whether they're your godchildren or not? For people who you may touch, what, do, what would you say are the, the core values that you hold in your community, right? In your community, in your ilays, in your own relationships um, that will help protect the integrity of these traditions um yeah the floor is open i know one of the things that it's a joke but it's not a joke in our um elay and it's it's interesting to say our elay because it's really not just one house it's a, an amalgamation of multiple houses um but the el we're all together you know we work each other's ochas or what have you and we always, when anybody ever asks a question, it's always go ask your godfather, go ask your godmother, go ask your elder, right? Um, even our elders, you know, say, go ask your godparent, you know, your godparent, go ask your elder. Um, and for me, that is fundamental, foundational, you know, um, to, and, and I'm lucky because as an Ajibona, I can say, go ask your godfather. And because I know the godfather <laughs> is, um, is uh the is my god sibling and he learned from my godmother and i know where the training is i can say ask your godfather you know just to, to to keep that to teach that that is not just me putting it off but that's really how you are supposed to always handle things you are supposed to get seek the elders seek the guidance and the permission of your godparent before you do anything right so it's it's a it's a joke but it's not a joke um, and uh, for us, it's really, it's, it's asking your elders, but it's also remembering why and what, uh, why your elders came to this tradition in the first place and established this Elay. You know, that, that's really a core thing um, 
particularly, again, like I said, I, I, I look at the history of African-Americans involved and, and, and why this is so important and how they built community with people with, you know, because of the tradition, you know, how they were exposed to people all over the world and within their own um, city um, because of the tradition, you know, so it's kind of remembering your roots, which is connected to ask your elder, ask your godparent, right? And who are your ancestors? It's, it, that's all a, a, a foundational ethical practice that I think, um, you know, I start with. I think if you would have asked me to use one word that um, that is is the key or the foundation uh, to my relationship with 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 my godchildren, and what my relationship was with my godmother, may she rest in peace. I was initiated by a man and, and a woman. The, the my godfather passed away uh, shortly after I finished my year, mm -hmm. and so my jubona became my godmother. Shortly after. Um, I would say it was about two or three years. She moved from New York to Florida. And um, my communication with her was regularly on the phone. And uh, I would come down. I would come, I'm now in Florida myself. I would come down uh, once or twice a year and she would go up. I received uh, a good six or seven Orishas from her in that, in that period of time. Um, I initiated people, she came up, I went down. Um, the foundation of our relationship was one of commitment and honesty to that relationship. So that, again, we're talking about technology. The only technology we had was the phone, but um, we maintained everything that we did in New York the same because there was honesty between us. There was there was a question needed being asked. It was asked uh, without any fear that it would be insulting or whatever. So honesty is the key to any relationship with my godchildren. That they can say to me, I, I say to them, well, what are we going to do now that you move to Florida? Well, I'm a phone call away. And if I need to be there, I'll be there. If you need to come down, you come down. Because I know I lived it and it works. But it's the commitment and that commitment is based on honesty. Thank you so much, Angela. And I wanna ask you a follow-up question, Angela, and, and this could be for any of you really. What, you, you kind of are talking also about commitment, but also reciprocity, right? Um, I, I, I saw something in the chat around this, sort of like obligations, like what, you know, well, and, and obligations, but also the fact that some people feel like, oh, but my elders don't teach me anything. Right. And so this is a, a common kind of thing that we hear. My elders don't teach me anything. And so I think folks have to have you all have provided a really good understanding of like, what are the conditions under which we learn and what are the mutual commitments that we need to have in order to learn? Um, and so Angela is talking about reciprocity. Akisi is talking a little bit about deference and respect. Mm -hmm. Right. Respect for your elders and deferring to your elders like even in their absence. Akisi's, Akisi's the, the, the Olocha who's like, oh, go ask your elder. <laughs> because that's, that's your responsibility, right? Part of your responsibility as a God child is to defer to your elders. Mm -hmm. um, and then I want to bring in again this thing of reciprocity, right? Like, you know, um, he who has, he, she, or they who have the disposition to learn mm -hmm. will always be the one who learns the most, right? Okay. Um, and with humility, back to our very early point, because your learning might begin in the kitchen, it might begin sweeping the floor, it might begin doing some small task that seems insignificant, but is actually foundational to learning much bigger things. Mm -hmm. um, and so, Rafael, I don't know if you have anything um, additionally to add to this, but what do you think are the conditions um, sort of that we need, or what conditions do you hold in your community to support this relationship of teaching and learning? Um, well, like I said, uh, you know, most we, we're doing a lot of like weekly uh, classes, and I'm saying mm -hmm. we as in a community, right? Um, so <laughs> the uh, community, the community, whether it be Ihalos or just people who are who are around. 
uh, they have a lot of access to information and a lot of things to learn. Um, eventually, when they decide to to do it more formally, like as if you like one thing is learning, right? Uh, trade, you know, over however you can learn it. And the other thing is like formally saying, I want to go to Duke University and I want to learn uh, psychology. Um when it's a formal thing, right? You, like I said, you go through certain, you go through a, first off, a, a very serious talk. Then you go through very serious oaths. Then you go through a very serious ritual. And this is after you initiate and after you have like basically the key in the door to be able to learn these things. Then you, you're able to start learning under, um, the condition right of your baba ifa so when the conditions are a list of things like about respect about the information you're gathering about not practicing when you're not ready about not taking on um, my hollows when you're not ready a whole bunch of certain things that you have to follow um to be able to even have access to learning more deeply so there's a whole bunch of information, but the the deeper information that has to do with like uh, the training of being like an Olorisha or a, or a Babalao or a Yanifa, that comes with a lot more things on it and a lot more conditions around it. Now, I definitely think that other temples, right, and especially in the diaspora, should start doing more um, classes, whether it be in person, whether it be online and, and instructing on the, on, on normal things, little things, like even the things that, you know, who is this Orisha, you know, who is this Irumole? What, who is this Egungung? Like, how do you, you know, all basically basics on what people should know if they're interested in this type of, um, practice. Yeah. Uh, because a lot of people don't have access to that and they get into it and later they say, whoa, wait a second. You know, my abuela, my mom ain't going to be happy with this, you know, like, you know, so it kind of, it, you know, I, I feel that people should know some basics and some foundation before actually starting to say, hey, I want to get my elekes or I want to get my hand of ifar, I want to get I want to get initiated, et cetera, et cetera. So, so ultimately what we're talking about, right, is, is scaffolding and a sort of scaffolding learning and also a deep commitment to be in relationship with one another in ways that are meaningful and not transactional, right? Um, and so fundamentally, I want to I wanna uplift that, you know, as we close, I want to uplift that and say that, you know, to one of Akisi's earlier points is that we've always adapted in order to survive. And so... You know, the question before all of us, I think, you know, which again, we have no finite answer to regardless of level of initiation is how do we ensure our continuity? How do we ensure, you know, and uh, transmission with integrity um, while adapting to changing external conditions um, and, and alienating, I think, as few people as possible, <laughs> right? And building connection rather than... Um, creating fragmentation amongst ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, and so with that, I want to invite y'all to your final word. I don't know if there, if there are any final thoughts you want to offer to the audience um, before you say good night. But I, I would like to, to give you all the last word. I would like to say anybody that's out there that is, is looking, that is unsure, that has had negative experiences, uh, if this is your path, make the commitment to continue on that path by continuing to look and 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 the more you look the more you will find and ultimately you will find where you're supposed to be but don't doubt or give up because of a bad experience many people out there have had bad experiences but it's part of the process yeah i agree with that it's part of the process sometimes usually and um you have to go through a lot of things and a lot of maybe hurt or a lot of frustration and stuff to finally get benefits 
So that's just like studying. That's just like a lot of times that's that's with experience. Right. You know, so sometimes you have to go through a lot of things. And I've heard this a lot. Wow. You know, I can't believe you guys got a house like this or, you know, uh, I've been through this and this and this. And it's like, you know, you you when you hear it out, you're like, yeah, like you had to go through that, you know, because your mentality was on that, like in that way or you were kind of like doing these things in that moment. You had to go through the fire, you know, to get to where you are now. So, like, maybe some people have to go through a bunch of stuff before they find someone like Ia, Angela, et cetera. So it's like, you you know, um, it's part of destiny. It's all destiny. Um, and I just to, to, to piggyback on that, uh, it reminds me of the saying, you don't know what you don't know. So take your time. You know, you really don't. Don't. Take your time, you know, be patient um, and have faith that you will find the right place for you uh, and that <clears throat> rushing never gets us <laughs> anywhere good, you nice. know. So, you know, all those truism, you know, good things come to those who wait, blah, 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 blah. You know, those things are actually very, very real. So trust, take your time um, and use the ashe that you already have. Uh, in search of the ashe that you're trying to get, you know, just common sense and, you know, good direction, and then you'll be all right. Thank you so much. I would like to, on behalf of the Creative Justice Initiative, I would like to thank Angela Fontanes, Felice Young. Thank you for joining us from Florida. Akisi Britton, Dr. Akisi Britton, my, my Obatalao Chun Twinsy sister. And our Awo, Rafael Maya Boruboya, thank you so much. And thank you to all of our viewers. I've just been told that we had over 400 viewers. So I feel I feel confident saying that we've been in community and used Ogun's Ache of technology Ache. to Ache. build bridges um, and broaden awareness. And for that, we are deeply grateful. Thank you all in our audience for being with us this evening. And thank you, of course, to Dr. Marta Moreno Vega for inviting us. Have a good evening, all. Stay safe. Ashe. Ashe. Ashe.